Welcome to the presentation on analog to digital conversion. We need analog to digital conversion mainly because our physical environment is analog and these are the signals that we want to process. Microprocessors on the other hand are digital so therefore we need something, a bridge to interface between those two worlds and an analog to digital converter provides that interface. It converts an analog signal into a digital signal. An ADC has both analog and digital functions. It is what we call a mixed signal device. It provides an output that digitally represents the input voltage or current. Please note that most ADCs convert voltage. An ADC has an analog reference voltage or current span against which the analog input is compared. The digital output word tells us what fraction of the reference voltage or current span is the input voltage or current. More output bits give better resolution and smaller steps. A smaller reference span gives smaller steps but can be at the expense of noise. This is a basic data acquisition flow diagram and we see at the very top this is what is changing this is what's in the environment this could be a temperature change a pressure change um, there's lots of things in the environment that are changing then we sample this change to what we call a transducer transducer is what we would probably term a sensor and the sensor picks up this change now, a sensor can sometimes change the environmental change into a resistive change. It could change it into a current change. It might change it into some sort of maybe an inductive change. The thing is, there's many types of sensors out there, but most of them do not inherently convert the environmental change into a voltage change. And even if it did, most instances, it's not going to be with the right range or span that the analog to digital converter requires. So therefore we have to do what's called signal conditioning. This is where such things as filtering, amplification, conversion as well occur. And by conversion I mean that if we have a resistive change we need to com uh, convert it to a voltage change. So that part is the conversion change. Then an example after that would be that we need to amplify it. So that's part of signal conditioning as well. So once we get done with one facet, there might be something else that has to be done to the signal to bring it to the point that it is acceptable for the analog to digital converter. Once that is done, the output of the ADC goes to a microprocessor and does the processing of the digital data. After that, the processor can show it, for example, maybe on a screen or may be able to save it. Uh, or may use that to uh, actuate a change external to it. While analog signals are continuous in both time and amplitude, a digital signal is discrete in both time and amplitude. We can see on the plot on the left we have an analog type signal and again it is varying but it is continuous. On the right we have points this is a good representation for digital sampling. Some of the advantages of digital signals are that they have high noise Im immunity, they have adjustable precision, they're easier to design, uh, they also are more reliable than analog types of circuits, uh, they have less need for calibration or for maintenance, you can easily create a lot of them, and they're easily controlled by a microprocessor or by some control logic. And it's a easy to record and store digital data also. Some of the disadvantages, though, are that they are inherently less accurate or precise than analog. The reason for this is because in the conversion process, we have an analog signal that has to be, per se, binned. It has to be put into a certain range of voltage and this and the specific range of, of, of voltage is going to be represented by a digital value and so therefore as long as you fall inside of that range 
whatever falls inside of it gets assigned the same value. So therefore, inherently, the conversion of analog to digital provides an output that has uh, some error in it. Now, we do need converters to communicate with an analog world, and so therefore, we have to go through this process of conversion, and inherently, there is a certain amount of error there, uh, both in the analog to digital converter part, and also we're trying to get a digital signal back to analog. The analog to digital conversion process uh, occurs with, with three steps, in a sense. Well, the first step is called sampling, the next one is quantification, and then coding. When sampling is occurring, basically the analog input is binned into a certain digital representation. Now this will depend as to how many bits you have in the ADC. If it's an 8-bit ADC or a 10-bit, so on and so forth, that will establish how many bins or how much a voltage range will be sliced into bins and then the analog input will be placed into bins. Again, the sampling will occur at, at specific intervals and with the output of that being assigned a digital value. In the quantification stage or step, and we've already talked about this in a previous slide, is where the um, analog value is binned into a digital representation. Now, depending as to how many bits you have in the ADC, and we're talking about the output, how many bits you have, will, uh, it will dictate as to how many bins you will actually have for a specific voltage range. So I'm going to give you an example of this. Here we have uh, a voltage range of 0 to 5 volts and let's just say that the analog to digital conversion is supposed to occur between that voltage span. So the ADC is configured to work between 0 and 5 volts. Now let's say that we have a 2-bit ADC a 2-bit analog to digital converter. And then on the right we have a 3-bit analog to digital converter. Well, let's start off with the one on the left. If it's a 2-bit ADC, that means it has two pins at the output. If it has two pins, it's going to give us four discrete output levels, only four. So therefore, if we were to do this, we could see that we would have something like this. We'd have four bins. This, for example, is one bin. This is another bin. This is another bin. And this is the last bin. So whatever signal you have as far as analog signal, it will try to be binned into one of those levels, depending as to when the sample was actually taken. So say if we had interval, Of say here and here and here and here we'd end up with a sample point there sample point here sample point here and a sample point there now wherever these samples point or uh, land in whichever bin those two samples here fall into this bin at the very bottom the next sample that's higher up falls into this bin and the next one falls into that bin but you only have four bins and if you can analyze it here these bins are fairly large so that means for a for a very large voltage change at the input you'll still get the same value at the output this for example would be like zero zero this would be zero one this would be one zero and this would be one one so you can see that anything that's inside of this area right here anything in this area that would be bin to 1 1 anything in this area here would be bin a 1 0 and then anything in this area here 
we build a uh, bend A01. And finally, at the very bottom would be a 00. zero. So a wide varying voltage input would still give you the same digital value. Let's take a look at the 3-bit ADC and see how that does. Let me move this over just a little bit right there. Now with this one here, since it's a 3-bit ADC, we're going to have eight different bins per se. And if I can draw this correctly here, this would be like bin where this is 0, 0, 0, the 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and finally 1, 1, 1. So again, for the same, same analog signal here, we can see that now we're able to bin it into, into smaller voltage ranges. So the range would be anywhere from here to here, from here to here, from there to there, from there to there, and so on and so forth. So now we're able to get a little bit closer what to what the actual value is. So therefore, as the resolution, as the number of bits increases, the finer the bins become, and therefore you can more accurately represent the analog signal that is being sampled. And this is what this slide shows. Here towards the right, we have a signal, excuse me, the output of the analog signal that's to the left. And the left has a varying signal that goes from negative five to plus five volts. But that analog signal is being sampled. And as we increase the number of bits, you can see that the bins or that the levels are becoming smaller in range. And therefore, you can more accurately represent the analog signal that was being sampled. One more thing to mention here is that the sampling, or I say to get a better, uh, a better representation at the output, also the sampling has to be done at a, a certain frequency or higher. If you're too low in frequency, you will not be able to represent the input signal accurately. The coding is where we're assigning a unique digital word to each sample, matching the digital word to the input signal. Again, this was shown in the, in the illustration, which was done in paint, in that we're trying to bin the analog voltage into a certain voltage range that is going to be assigned a specific digital output value. One of the things that's very important is to figure out what the resolution is. And resolution is basically 2 to the nth, where n is the number of bits. Now with that known, we can go one step further and figure out what the voltage resolution is. And voltage resolution is the amount of input voltage needed to see a 1-bit change at the output. In other words, the voltage resolution is how much voltage does each output bit represent? If we stated it a different way, you could say that the voltage resolution is the voltage span of each bin. What is one bin worth in its voltage range? For example, let's say that we had a 4-bit A to D. So we have our analog to digital conversion. We have our input. We'll call that VN. And let's say that it's 4-bit analog to digital converter. We have our D0, our D1, D2, and D3. Now with those four outputs, what's the resolution? Well, resolution, as was just shown, is equal to to the nth, where n is the number of bits. This is 4 bits, so that would give us 24. And I just noticed an uh, error. This is not 24. This is 16. My calculator, for some reason, gave me 24. I'm not too sure exactly. I must have punched in something incorrectly. But the value is 16. 
So we have 16 bins per se that the analog input voltage will be uh, placed into or could possibly be placed into. Now the other thing to understand also is what is the voltage span of conversion? Well, in most instances you will have it stated somewhere as far as what the voltage span of the conversion is. What's the uh, the range of conversion? This one, let's just say it's configured from 0 volts through 5 volts, meaning that the input signal is going to be converted based on that range. Or, in other words, that the 16 bins are going to be from 0 volts up to 5 volts. Now, let's figure out the voltage resolution. Voltage resolution is equal to, as we just saw, to the reference span divided by 2 to the n minus 1. So the reference span again is what is the range of conversion? That's the 0 through 5 volts which I was speaking about. So the voltage resolution here is going to be the span which is from what to what? Well the span itself is from 0 to 5 volts so the span is 5 volts. So we have a span of 5 volts divided by 2 to the nth minus 1. Well 2 to the nth was 16 minus 1 is 15. So therefore each of the bins has a voltage span of 0.333 volts or 333.3 millivolts. That means that each one of those bins right, is able to handle 3, uh, 0.333 volts of the input or that the voltage at the input could change by that amount okay before it actually affects a change again at the output now let's talk about a different ADC let's say that we have an ADC that is 8-bit again we have our VN and we have 8 outputs we have D7 all the way down to D0 so it's an 8-bit and let's say that this ADC is, is again set to work between 0 volts and 5 volts well, resolution would be equal to, again, 2 to the nth, which is going to be 2 to the eighth, which is equal to 256. Now, the voltage resolution, how much is each of the bins worth, per se, is equal to the span. Well, it works from 0 volts to 5 volts. That's the span that the conversions will be done on from 0 to 5 volts. So therefore the span is going to be 5 volts divided by 2 to the nth minus 1. Well that's 256 minus 1 which is going to be 255. So we have a voltage resolution of 19.61 millivolts. Now that's per bit. Okay, Each bit is worth that much. That means that the input has to change by that much to affect a 1-bit change at the output. Now another way that you could look at it is that you're going to have 255 bins and each one of them is going to be worth 19.61 millivolts. This is an example of a 3-bit ADC and what we have here is we have a span of 0 to 5 volts which therefore provides us a voltage resolution of 0.7143 volts. That means that the input could change by that much before you see a 1 bit change at the output. And so you have a total of 8 bins starting at 000 all the way to 111. The accuracy of an ADC can be improved by increasing either the sampling rate or the resolution. Now to get higher accuracy you can take more samples which will give you a better representation of the analog signal. The other one is you can actually have higher resolution which means more bins and it, therefore if you have more bins per se the actual voltage span of each bin gets smaller so therefore, it can more accurately represent the analog signal which is being sampled. 
Now, there are some problems, is that if you go too high on the resolution, right, one of the things that happens is that you might actually start to quantize eyes actual noise. Every signal has noise in it. The question is, is it okay to go that far? Obviously, it's not, because what you want to do is you want to sample the actual signal and not start to sample the actual noise in the signal. So when the voltage resolution starts to become equal to the noise uh, amplitude in the signal, that's when you start to have problems, especially if the, if the uh, voltage resolution amount goes underneath the noise amplitude, then it starts to convert noise itself into an output. So the goal of any signal is to have a high signal to noise ratio. You want your signal to noise, which is a fraction, you want this value to be high. And when you have an SNR value that is high, that means that your signal to noise ratio is actually very, very good, meaning that your noise is very small and your signal is very large. When we were talking about bins, bins again are a range of voltage that the analog signal that is being sampled is going to be placed into and each of the bins has a digital output word assigned to it. Now the thing is is that how much error could there be in there because again anything that falls inside of the bin is still assigned the same output value so how much error could you have? Well here the quantization error is the difference between an analog wave and its digital representation. So how much error could you have? Well, as it states here, most ADC manufacturers introduce an offset into the A to D converter to force an error range of less than one half least significant bit. Well, the least significant bit is going to have a voltage resolution of whatever you've figured out. So therefore one half of that is how much quantization error you have. In other words, the, quanti the maximum quantization error is equal to half the voltage of the least significant bit. So in going back to our exercise here, if someone was to ask well, what is the maximum error, what is the quantization error that you have in either one of these well, that would be fairly straightforward. We could say that the quantization error is going to be one half of the voltage resolution. So therefore, in, our, in this example, the one on the left, we would have 333.3 millivolts divided by 2, and that's equal to 166.6 millivolts. So that is how much quantization error you have. For the example on the right, again, the quantization error is equal to one half of the voltage resolution. So therefore you have one half of 19.61 millivolts. So that's going to be equal to 9.805 millivolts. Well, how fast should I sample? That's another uh, important facet of analog to digital conversion. Well, the analog signal is sampled every so often, and so therefore this is the sampling interval. Now, the frequency is equal to 1 over the sampling interval time and this is called the sampling rate or the sampling frequency. Now according to the Nyquist Channon theorem, the sampling rate must be at least two times greater than the highest frequency contained in the sampled signal. Sampling below the Nyquist Channon rate produces a result called aliasing. So what is aliasing? Well this is the result of sampling below the Nyquist rate and this shows up when the discrete time signal is converted back into a continuous time signal. In other words, 
when we sample the signal and convert it to a digital form and then we take the digital form and convert it back to analog do we get the same signal again if we don't then we have what's called aliasing so aliasing is the presence of unwanted components in the reconstructed signal these components were not present when the original signal was sampled so here we have a sine wave that is being sampled and then is being reconstructed on the right. The first one is we're sampling at the Nyquist rate, which is twice the highest frequency of the signal. And so therefore we're able to represent the signal against the output. Even though it does look like a triangle wave, it's pretty close to still following the sine wave and it also still has the same frequency. Now, if we sample higher than the Nyquist rate, well, it's going to more accurately represent the sine wave. That's what is shown here. Now, the issue is when we undersample. If we sample underneath the Nyquist Shannon rate, we should be twice that of the highest frequency. If we sample under that, then when we reconstruct the signal, we get a different frequency out. That's called aliasing and that's not a good thing. So once again, when we sample, we need to be at least two times greater than the highest frequency contained in the sample signal. So if you have several different frequencies, always remember you have to sample at twice, at least, okay, at least at twice the highest uh, frequency that's in the signals. Here are some examples. The phone company digitizes voice by assuming a maximum frequency of 4,000 Hertz. The sampling rate is therefore set to 8,000 samples per second. And also, it is generally accepted that the range of human hearing is from about 200 Hertz to about 20 kilohertz. The standard sampling frequency for digital audio recordings is 44.1 kilohertz. So you can see that we're uh, sampling at least twice the highest frequency that the signal contains. The signal sometimes, the analog signal to be sampled, sometimes um, has uh, an infinite amount of harmonics. One of the things that could be done to get a better sample is to put an analog filter at the front end in order to limit the frequency band to its useful part. So if you know what part of the signal you want, one of the things you could do is to place a filter at the front to basically remove any signals that are unwanted. There are several different types of ADCs. There's a ramp, there's a single slope, dual slope, su uh, successive approximation, flash and sigma delta. So these are all different ways to do conversion and some are faster than others, some are used more than others and uh, depending as to what the application is or as to uh, what is the end result, like if you want an ADC that's very 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 fast, will depend as to which type is actually employed. Here we have the ramp method, and let me just read what it says here. Hopefully that's um, fairly enough to explain it. Once a conversion is triggered, the counter starts counting in binary, and it's fed to the DAC. Now, DAC is a digital to analog converter, so the output of the counter is going to be converted from a digital form to an analog form that's going to a comparator which is the triangle that's in pink and so the comparator is comparing the VN that's the signal that is being sampled against the output of the DAC and the counter keeps counting until the comparator changes state so the counter is starting to count off at zero so starting off at zero then it counts to one and two and so on and so forth and as the count increases, the voltage at the output of the digital to analog converter keeps on rising. 
at some point the comparator sees that the output of the DAC is above that of the in and it stops and therefore then the output values of the counter are seen at d0 through d to the nth. Now one of the problems with this approach is that if you have a VN that's fairly close to zero, say like a volt, as opposed to another signal that might be a little bit further away, like say four volts, which voltage would the counter arrive at sooner? Because it's counting up, right? And let's just say that this particular ADC is supposed to work between zero and five volts. That's the that's the conversion range of it from zero to five volts. So the counter is going to start counting. The output of the DAC is going to be at zero volts to start off with, and then it's going to go upwards from that. Well, it should be apparent that it's going to hit the one volt mark a lot sooner than it hits four volts. So when it hits one volt, it's going to stop. But if it was four volts, it's going to have to continue to two volts and three volts and finally hit uh, four volts. So therefore, one of the things about this is that there's a problem with conversion times. The conversion times are not consistent. The conversion times are really going to be hinged as to how far away the input voltage is uh, from, per se, the starting of the conversion range. Next we have the, symbol, uh, the single slope method. And this method is very similar to the ramp method except that it uses an integrator instead of a DAC. The integrator is said to produce a sawtooth waveform which spans the entire range of voltage conversion. The instant the waveform is started, the counter starts counting from 0 to 2 to the nth minus 1. When the voltage found at Vn is equal to the voltage achieved by the integrator, the control circuit captures the last value produced by the counter. This value is the binary representation of the analog input voltage. Again, we have a counter. It's going to be counting up. And so, therefore, it's going to reach one voltage a lot sooner than another. Again, we're going, uh, we're going to have inconsistent conversion times. So this is not a good thing either. So both the ramp method and the single slope methods are not uh, used. They were used a long time ago but they have been replaced by more consistent ways of doing A to D conversion. Here we have the dual slope method and the sample signal charges a capacitor for a fixed amount of time. By integrating over time, noise integrates out of the conversion. Then the ADC discharges the capacitor at a fixed rate while a counter counts the ADC's output bits. A longer discharge time results in a higher count. Again, we're having uh, inconsistent times here. So again, this is not a very good approach. Some of the advantages and disadvantages of the dual slope method are shown here. On the advantage side, the input signal is average, greater noise immunity than other ADC types, and they have high accuracy. On the disadvantage side, they're slow, and high precision external components required uh, to achieve accuracy. Again, this is not a method that is widely used. It had been used um, back a, a ways, but it's not currently being used now. One of the methods that is still being used currently is what we call successive approximation. Now, with this here, the successive approximation register feeds binary search values once starting with the MSB into the digital converter, digital to analog converter, and checks the status of the comparator output. A binary search value remains as long as the digital to analog converter output is still less than the analog input value. Now one of the things is that uh, I want to spend just a little bit of time on this explaining it. So here we go. Let's say that the ADC is operating with a input voltage span of 5 volts and it works from 0 through 5 volts so that's the conversion span and so let's look at what the output of the digital to analog converter will appear like so let's say that we have our digital to analog converter here 
and let's say that it's 8-bit. So since it's 8-bit, we're going to be feeding in or have 8 input lines to our digital to analog converter, something like this. And here we have our D7, D6, D5, D4, D, it's supposed to be D3, D2, D1, and D0. Now that's being fed from the successive approximation register, so let's just say that that's our, our SAR right here. So successive approximation register. Now the SAR is going to turn on one bit at a time and it's going to send the output of the digital to analog converter and it's going to compare it through a comparator and the comparator is done here. Our VN is being sampled by by the comparator and it's going to be sampled against the output of the digital to analog converter and the comparator output is providing feedback to the SAR. Now what the SAR does, it's going to turn on one bit and it's going to uh, send that uh, value uh, uh, which, will, uh, imp which will set a voltage at the digital to analog converter output. So let's run through something like this. And since we're talking about zero through five volts and it's eight bit, let's just say that that we figure out what the resolution is. So resolution is equal to 2 to the nth, which is equal to 256. And voltage resolution is equal to the input voltage span, which is 5 volts, divided by the 2 to the nth minus 1, which is 255, which gives us approximately 19.6 millivolts per bit. Now with that stated, when one of the bits gets turned on, what is the worth or what is the voltage output of the digital to analog converter when only that bit is high and everything else is off, is a low? Well, if there was a D7, D7 when it's on, it has um, a weight of 128, right? Because when we look at the weights, I know that uh, D0 is 1 and D1 is 2 and then 4. And then we have 8 and 16 and 32 and 64 and 128. But what I'm talking about is how much of a voltage will be output at the digital to analog converter. Well, if D7 is turned on by the SAR and everything else is low, that's going to incur weight at the output of the digital to analog converter which is going to be half of the span, which is going to be 2.5 volts. So if D7 is on, that's going to give us, which is has a weight of 128, that's going to give us 2.5 volts out. That's at the output of the digital to analog converter. If D6 is on, and just D6, and we have a weight of 64, that's going to be half of 128, which would be half of 2.5, so that's 1.25 volts. D5, which is 32, is half of the 64, which is D6, which is half of the 1.25, which is going to be 0.625 volts. D4, which is 16, is going to be half of the 0.625, which is 0.312 and D3 is has a weight of 8 and since 8 is half of 16 it's going to be half of the point one, point 0.3125 which is 0.15625 and D2 has a weight of 4 is going to be half of uh, 8 and so therefore that's going to be 0.078125 volts and then we have D1 which has a, a weight of 2 it's going to be half of that previous one which is 0 0.0390625 and then finally D0 has a weight of 1 it's going to be equal to half of the previous one which is going to be 0 0.019532 
one to five volts. So the way that the SAR will figure out as far as what the conversion is, is really something like this. If we were to let VN be equal to say one volt exactly, what the SAR would do, it would turn on a D7 first, and so therefore the one volt would be compared against 2.5 volts. And if it's gone over, it turns off D7 and then turns on D6. D6 is going to place 1.25 volts. Again, it's gone above your V in value of 1 volt, so therefore it turns off D6. Then it turns on D5. If it turns on D5, it says, well, I have not gone over, so it leaves D5 on. So let's just say that it does have uh, that value on, so it's 0.625 volts that is on, so D5 is left on. Then it turns on D4. D4 is going to be added to the 0.625 and so that would mean that we're adding 0.3125 volts. If we do that, we'll have 5, 7, 3, and 9. So we have 0.9375 volts present because we have uh, D5 and D4 on. It has not gone over, so it leaves those intact. And then it adds 0.15625. So in adding this, 0.15625. It would give us 5, 7, 3, 9, and 1, and a 0. Well, it's gone over, so it's going to turn that uh, bit off. So it turns off D3, and so that's not going to count because it's gone over 1 volt. Next, it turns on uh, D2, and D2 is going to add a 0.078125. Which gives us a 5 and a 2, a 6, a 5, a 1, and a 1.1. Again, it's gone over, so it turns off that bit and goes on to the next bit. And the next bit is going to be D1, and that's going to add 0.0. .0 Zero six two five, so that's five, a two, a six, a five, a six, a seven, and a nine. Since it has not gone over, it leaves that one on, so it leaves D one on, and then finally, it turns on D zero, which is adding a point zero one nine five three one. 2 and a 5. So that's a 5, a 7, a 3, a 9, a 0, a 6, a 9, and a 9. So it's going to leave D0 on because it has not gone over 1 volt. So it leaves that one on. Now the thing about it is that for an 8-bit successive approximation type of A to D, it's going to do 8 comparisons. But it's going to do 8 comparisons every time. If you have a 12-bit successive approximation A to D, it's going to do 10 bits. It's going to do 10 comparisons every time. So the conversion times for this particular uh, type of ADC are very consistent. That's why this type of a converter is still use, is still in use, and uh, it is still found. The advantages for the successive approximation method are the capability of high speed, medium accuracy compared to other ADC types and has a good trade-off between speed and cost. Some of the disadvantages is that um, it's higher resolution successive approximation ADCs will be slower. Why? Because it has to do that many more comparisons. If you have an 8-bit ADC of this type it's going to do 8 comparisons. If you have a 12-bit it's going to do 12 comparisons so therefore it's going to take a little bit longer the higher the resolution you go. Another method is the flash conversion. The flash conversion is going to have a lot of comparators. Basically, it's going to have 2 to the nth uh, minus 1 comparators in there. So, for example, if you have an 8-bit flash converter, it's going to have 
255 comparators. Now what it does, it has a voltage divider arrangement and the comparator is directly, or the comparators I should say, are directly comparing Vn against each of the voltage divider points. And it has, uh, for an 8-bit, 255 of them. Now, the beauty of the flash conversion is that it does all the comparisons all at the same time. All at once, it does all of them. So therefore, this approach is very, very, very fast. So if you want to do analog video to digital video conversion, then this is a type of an ADC which should be used, the flash conversion type. So the advantages are there that it's very fast. On the downside, it needs many parts. It needs 255 comparators for an 8-bit ADC. Now granted, these can be placed into a single chip, of course, but still, uh, the intensity of it is that all that has to be in there. The, it also has lower resolution, it's expensive, and the amount of power consumed is fairly large. The last one to talk about is the Sigma Delta. And the way that this operates is that oversampled input signal goes in the integrator, and the output of the integrator is compared to ground. Then it iterates to produce a serial bitstream, and the output is a serial bitstream with a number of ones proportional to Vn. This is probably the most complicated uh, way of doing ADC, but it's one of the uh, cheapest ways or, uh, um, in it being implemented into, into hardware. So a lot of the more uh, current uh, types of processors that have A to D in them will have this type of a converter inside them, mainly because it's a lot cheaper to make than any of the other types. The advantages are it's high resolution, uh, and no pre uh, precision external components are required, but some of the disadvantages, or the one that's shown here, is that it's slow due to oversampling, because the more sampling that it does, the more it hones in into the actual value. Okay, So it doesn't just do a single sample, it has to continu continuously sample and sample and sample in order to hone in into the actual value that is more accurate or maybe perhaps better stated the more samplings you get the better the accuracy becomes and here's a comparison of the ADC types and uh, this right here should hopefully indicate uh, which type is perhaps better than others and so on and so forth depending as to again what is required and this concludes the presentation on the analog to digital converter